Good morning. Uh, as Scott said, I'm Don, and I'm going to present today about an evaluation of SCOUR on uh, the difference between 1D and 2D, uh, just some of the differences and some of the troubles we had with that. So a little overview of what I'll speak about is the location and history. I got some images of the site to kind of familiarize you with it <clears throat> and uh, the model and the results. So this is the Leaf River watershed in, uh, in kind of, let's see if I can, how you point this thing? Oh, that was it. So we're looking in central, east central Mississippi over here. You can kind of see just south of I-20, Interstate 20. And we're looking at the Leaf River down here. So we've got 460 square miles of watershed, which produces a pretty good bit of rain, a pretty good bit of flow, I mean. Uh, this is a LIDAR image. And you can see we have a very wide floodplain. It's about a mile and a half wide. We have a relief structure over here that was replaced in, I think, 1997. But what we're going to look at is this bridge right here on... Uh, 28, it has some interesting features as you'll see, and this is a, a quite a meandering river. A little bit about what I think is going on here is this, before they built the road and it was constricted, <clears throat> it would, uh, the flow would come down and it would flood this whole thing. It wasn't a river really, it was more of a swamp, and it's a big swamp. <laughs> but now since they've channelized it, <clears throat> excuse me, since they've kind of constricted the flow and channelized it, it it's kind of incised a little bit, and it, it's gone all the way down com comparatively to the edge. It's gone down pretty deep to a clay layer, which is consolidated. It's pretty hard, and uh, it, what it does is kind of skirts over, so it's a very mobile channel. It moves a lot. Uh, this is a image of the flood map. It does have a floodway, but I was just looking at Scour. We're not replacing anything, so I didn't have to deal with FEMA. That's a good thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so in 1900, when the original bridge was built, there was actually a bridge before that. Uh, it was a suspension bridge, but we don't have any information at all for it, but we found the old column piers in the overbanks south of the current location. In 1960, uh, or pre-1960, we don't have a date for that either, they built a straight jetty just upstream of one of the piers, and you'll see remnants of it when I, when I continue. Uh, it was a double road timber pile. In 1961, they had about a 50-year event. There, there didn't seem any problems, so the jetty was considered a success. In 1970, they built a new bridge 50 feet upstream. And in 1974, a 100 year event occurred, and there was rapid erosion it bent to, and it continued all the way. Uh, in 1975, they lost 90 foot of bank uh, since 74. And so Bent 2 was only had eight, pop, eight foot of penetration left. And uh, the bank had receded all the way to Bent 4, and I'll show you an images of the Bent in just a second. But uh, they put riprap there, and it disappeared. Uh, and so they said, we need something better to do. So they decided to put a curved jetty right in front of the Bent 2. Uh, th this is what the bridge looks like. It's a uh, six span. Uh, it's concrete cast in place. So this is an image uh, from a 1978 report from the FHWA and the USGS. They uh, did a report on countermeasures. So as you can see here, during construction, you have Pier A and Pier B, and that's where your channel was. It's no longer there. So 1970, your top of banks here, 73, 75, and this they believe that this occurred in 1974. One event, one flood event, pushed the top of bank, if you will, all the way back to Pier 4. And this is a guy standing in the scour hole. This is, this is at Bent 4 in 1975. So you can see the, it's, it's nothing but sand. This whole top here is all sand. Very, very mobile uh, sediment. Uh, so this is what they did. When they built the new bridge, they were smart enough to put a guide bank here. And this is the old jetty. Where's that? Uh, down here. And this is the old channel. And this is where the new curved jetty went in 1975, which was great. It did its job perfect. This is just a, uh, how the channels migrated over time. You can see here it had a big bend just upstream. 
and it used to come down and, it, and the thou wig went over here between pier A and pier B. But as you can see, it's migrated over since and uh, it's had a cutoff. That cutoff occurred, I believe, in 2005 or so. If I looked at these numbers, I could probably tell you, but that's a lot of lines. So some images. This is Pier B. This is standing from the bank looking at Pier B. You can see the jetty in front of uh, Bent 2 over here. And I'm standing on hard ground where the channel used to be. Well, I say hard, it's sand. But uh, the channel has definitely it started to migrate all the way. They put the jetty in, and so it kind of stopped when they put the jetty in. And the, they, you can see they got riprap on the side of it here. Um, this is just an image of the different flow conditions it's ha it has. Uh, low flow, there, there's a natural constriction point right here. You can't really see it, but it's uh, some rock jutting out. And this is the old pier bent. You can see here, this is the old straight jetty that was in front of that pier. And uh, this right here, I, I believe, I'm not sure, I have no way to prove this, led to the channel kind of shifting over to the west. And uh, because they left this standing, there's remnants of it. You, if you go down channel, you can find pieces of it. Um, so it's just two different flow conditions here. This is the bank protect, protection they built in 1975. It's not doing too well. So <laughs> that's why they had us look at it. Uh, it's doing a great job, but we don't know how much longer it'll last. So this is kind of a comparison of the two models. These are both uh, from the FIS study, the uh, cross sections from FEMA. So that's a start point and an end point. You can see uh, we, we tried to represent it as best we could, uh, multiple open situation. And you can see the mesh domain with the detail around both bridges. So this is pretty much the bridge layout for both the HECRAS and the SRH2D models. We couldn't really figure out a good way to to model the jetty in Hegras. There was really no way to do it, so we didn't. Uh, I tried in values. I, I tried all kinds of things. There was just no good way to do it. Uh, we tried different ways. We tried blocked obstructions in the 2D model. We weren't getting the results we knew we should have. There was, it was blocking flow, but it was still coming through. And even though it is slatted, it, it, it allows flow through. We decided to go with a void because we know that flow is not a whole lot. And as soon as we put the void in, we got what we expected to see, which is more of a circulation behind it, which would result in the deposition, as you can see here. And it, it worked great turning the flow. We got just what we thought we would see. You can see higher velocities around the back of, backside of the jetty and over the guide bank. Um, and this is just a close-up of it. You can see we really got that. And, and with the blocked obstruction, we couldn't get it. I mean, we tried and we tried, but there was it, it just really slowed the flow down. So this was definitely the way to go. Uh, this is just kind of an oblique view of what kind of flows we were getting for the 500-year event. Now, Mississippi does not have mountains, so this is a 15 to 1 exaggeration. Uh, yeah, no mountains. Uh, and we got overtopping over here, which the 1D model did not predict, and uh, of course, for the scour analysis, we could not put this bridge in the Wendy model because we couldn't get the values we wanted. These are just some of the flows. As you can see, they're the FEMA and the USGS report. They, they're, they're close, I guess, if 10,000 CFS is close. These are the water surface elevations for the, our calibration, which occurred in, in 1997. So I'm going to get up on my soapbox real quick. An in value is an in value. It, it shouldn't change from one model to another because it's, it's the same grass is grass. Uh, the road is road, I mean. It, it shouldn't change. So we built this model, and the very first run I did for this calibration, I was within, I think, less than 500th of a foot on my calibration. And then head grass was two feet different with the same in values. So we tried to adjust the end values for HECRAS, but they became unrealistic. And I mean, you, you, so we just decided to use what we had, the current end values we have for the 2D model in the HECRAS model, even though they didn't work so much for the calibration, it just made sense. 
Oh, point, I do have it on there. Point oh 0.02 feet. That's how close we were in the 2D model on the first run. That was so we didn't change anything. It was good. Uh, but as you can see, it was uh, two and a half feet different on the 1D model. Um, and they went out there for this flood event, USGS did. They went out there, they calculated the flow. So we have all these values from this calibration event that we tried to match. You can see that the relief bridge, we were pretty close, we weren't exact. And that's because if you go back to the other, they've built, uh, uh, they dammed off a lake and they've had a pretty good bit of uh, residential construction in the area since 1997. So our flows are a little different, a little higher. Uh, but you can see the 1D model had only 550 going over there. And like I said, we couldn't really model the relief bridge. I couldn't get a good value. I mean, it gave me a value, but I didn't even bother putting it in here. So the results between the two models are, uh, for the HECRAS model, it showed about two feet lower than the 2D model did. The velocity was higher. So that resulted in a little bit higher scour values. Um, the flow, I don't know why that came in backwards. I thought I had that. Anyway, whatever. The flow split, the distribution between the two, they didn't correlate very well. As you can see, uh, the HECRAS put a pretty good bit uh, more flow over into the relief bridge. I mean, less flow over into the relief bridge. And that, that's just not the case because it can't even get over there. But there's no way to tell the, the HECRAS model that, you know, there's a dam here. I, I tried. I put my cross section through where they have a road going to a house. But it just didn't, there was no way to really tell it that you, you can't go over there. So it put much more flow through the relief bridge because it, it just, the way it operates, you know, I'm sure most people in here know that it operates on, you know, just conveyance. So it's, it sees an opening, so it shoves it over there. Uh, the contraction scour. For the 1D, we showed no scour on the left overbank. And uh, we got 6.7 feet of live bed in the channel versus the 2D, which had 24 feet of live bed. And it's, this channel has migrated, and we know it moves. The 24 seems much more realistic because it, it has a pretty incised channel in there. Um, the, the right over bank, they correlated pretty well, except for the 500-year event. And that's because on the 500-year event, for the, as I showed in that earlier slide, it has overtopping on the right side, which did not occur in the 1D model because of the difference in the water surface elevation. Uh, so this, again, is just what I wanted to show to illustrate that uh, some of the differences in the scour is you, we never saw this. Uh, lack of scour on this pier, particularly right here, because, like I said, we didn't include that jetty in the windy model. But also, we got high. The another reason for the higher abutment scour on the left side is you can see where the flow is coming around the guide bank and and attacking this at different angles, which is something we didn't realize in the windy model. Okay, a little history. Mississippi DOT wanted us to look at both the windy and the 2D. Normally, we would just look at this in the 2D. But they wanted to see both. And so they wanted us to look at the 1D without using the 2D to influence the 1D. That's what we did. So looking at it, the flood plane comes straight down. So we didn't look at any angle of attack on Scour for the 1D model. But for the 2D model, we did. So because it's there. Uh, and for the abutment Scour, we used uh, NCHRP 2420. And on the left and the right, you got, uh, come on, there it is. You have less scour on condition uh, on the left abutment and more scour on the right abutment. And again, that's because that jetty's not in there uh, for the 1D model. Uh, we did two different forms of uh, contraction, calcu uh, contraction scour calculations, I mean, peer scour calculations. So these are results for the 1D and the 2D models. There's not a whole lot of difference in there, but uh, I have another slide that shows the actual difference. The peer scour, again, on this slide, the peer scour is not adjusted for skew. So as you can see, there's 
in particular, uh, bent two where the jetty's at. Um, it's, there's not a whole lot of difference, but there's a pretty good bit of difference. And uh, on bent three, right here, verse 6.8 versus 13.4, and that's due to again to that scour coming around the abut between the abutment and the jetty, and the angle of attack that it had, which was about 30 degrees, I believe. So. For pier scour, we would not know about the skew if it was not for the 2D model. Because, I mean, again, the floodplain is coming straight down. We know it's wide. We know it's flowing big. And we just didn't assume that it would have that type of skew on it, but it did. Uh, my slides are kind of coming in backwards, so I don't know why. But anyway, um, we adjusted the 1D for skew. And then it really kind of comes in a lot closer once we did that. As you can see, we went from the 13.1 to 13.4 on that bent that is really affected by the jetty and the abutment. I mean, they correlated pretty good, but we wouldn't have known that if it wasn't for the 2D model. So here's the difference once they were adjusted, and you can see that the 1D model underestimated the scour by uh, 6.3 feet on that particular bent, bent three, and at, for the 100-year event, I should say. And it underestimated the scour on everything except for bent two, even though it wasn't looking at the jetty right in front of it. They, they turned out to be the same, and that's because we used it in the 2D model and the scour calculations show that there is no scour at that bent due to the fact that the jetty's right in front of it, and it, it does its job well. It's just hope it don't fall. This is kind of a scour plot showing the different types of scour. Uh, and this is the 100-year scour plot with the jetty in place. And so if that jetty failed, you would get this plot. Uh, we modeled it both with and without the jetty. And as you can see from this one with the jetty, you'll get a whole lot more over here <laughs> when the jetty fails. And so it is a scour critical bridge. And why we went with the 2D results, when we reported our results to MDOT, we did our recommendation based on the 2D model, not the 1D model for obvious reasons. Uh, the 2D model, it provides much more accurate mapping of the floodplain. We, we found that our boundaries on the outside edge match closely to what was observed in 1997 on a calibration event. Um, so we couldn't really control how the 1D model distributed. So I don't know how many of y'all done scour in 1D, but you have to block off that relief bridge and take all your values and your um, stagnation point. It seems to me, and I'm not sure because I don't know the code, but when you have the two relief bridges in your multiple opening situation, it takes the stagnation point and puts it at the abutment of whatever your relief bridge is, all the way over. And But using the vectors from the 2D model, we were able to say, this is where your flow splits. We could see it. I wish I, I should have put an image of that in there. But So we actually measured how far over it was for our abutment calculations. Uh, the 2D model obviously has more complex flow around the structure, as you saw. You can really get in there, and it's slowing the velocity down so much that you have more sediment drop out, and that's really what built the banks back to, I won't say pre-construction because the channel's moved, but behind the jetty structure, it's obviously much better than it was. Um, the 2D model was the appropriate method for modeling this complex structure and for all complex structures, I would say. And to quote my friend Scott Hogan, you don't know what you don't know. The angle of attack, we wouldn't have known. There's all kinds of stuff that we use. If we would have done this the way I wanted to, we would have used the information from the 2D model to influence the 1D model. But as I said earlier, Mississippi DOT did not want us to do that. So, are there any questions? All right, thanks, Don. Any questions for Don? With the historic mobility of the channel, did you look into long term degradation? Well, it's actually skating on top of a, a very consolidated clay. Uh, we have bore samplings from when they built the relief bridge in 1997, and we did look at that. But what the channel seems to be doing is it goes down to that clay layer and stays. But it shifts left to right, and it just kind of slides on top of that clay. And so there's really, 
it's not going to go much deeper. I mean, eventually it will erode that, but it, it's pretty stable depth-wise. Laterally, it, it moves a lot. Um, thanks for the presentation. It was really good. Um, question is, is MDOT, do you think, looking at maybe making a policy change and, and requiring use of 2D modeling for, for bridge scour? That's a tough question. Uh, they were. They are, when I was there, we were working on a new hydraulic manual, which required that everything be 2D. But since then, they have kind of a change of regime, if you will. And they're actually kind of backpedaling, whereas they were doing more 2D modeling, pretty good bit of it. Now they're wanting to replace in kind. So I'm actually looking at one of their sites now that is scour critical, and they want to go back with the same size bridge. And I'm like, well, you're, you're not helping anything. You're, you're, going to have a, you're going to build a scour critical bridge. And so we're trying to help them say that that's a bad idea. But, you know, it really just depends. Uh, I don't know if y'all have heard of what we refer to in Mississippi as bridge gate, but we had FHWA come down and actually look at some of our bridges that are not on the state system. They're on the county system. And while they were looking at 10 bridges, they shut down eight of them. And then they came back and shut down, like, I believe it was 82 more in the state. And uh, so they said the, the county engine, these are, these are not state bridges. These are local bridges, uh, local county bridges. And the county engineers who are supposed to be inspecting them, I think they were just getting paid. And uh, they were like, yeah, that's good, trust me. And, but we went out there. <laughs> I got some pictures for that I can show you, too. We went out to one pier, and you could literally stick your hand through it. But that was a good bridge, according to them. So we just, actually in Mississippi, we just had a special session uh, like last week where they came up with a whole lot money, more money for bridges. So we're hoping that we'll look at these bridges in more of a 2D environment instead of the 1D environment because there's so much more accuracy you get looking at that way. Uh, and we hope they don't shut down anymore because it, it's a long way to work. Any other questions for Don? Anybody else? Okay, thanks, Don. All right. Thank you.